When we observe flowers and blooming vegetables, we're looking at the upside down spread eagle genitalia of the plant, brashly displayed in bold colors. Each a genetic experiment to find which colors and arrangements will aid in the most reproductive material being released and distributed. A rose blooms open and displays its colors like a peacock or a bird of paradise, but the aim is not to directly dissipate its reproductive material into the atmosphere or to fling them like the hairy bittercress. Rather, it takes advantage of faster moving organisms, bees, hornets, wasps, and hummingbirds. It attracts other species with its vibrant visual displays and enticing pheromones, and resigns itself to a state of interspecies cuckoldry, preferring to watch as an entirely different species inseminates a fellow flower. Now we must ask ourselves, which part of the rose is actually the rose? How many plants prefer to stay mostly underground and only protrude small greeneries through the surface to soak up sunlight and reproduce? The root system eats the earth, and the flowers and leaves eat the sunlight. Both drink in the rain, but mostly the roots. The root system shares nutrients with other roses, and will often constrict and overtake the roots of offending species. The flowers attract insects and birds based on pheromone and visual stimuli. Specifically, the refraction of specific wavelengths of sunlight to produce specific colors that can be seen by the bees, and release molecules that align well with the shape of the dendrites connected to the neurons in the bee's brain, its olfactory receptor system. The prettier and nice smelling the reproductive organ, the more successful it will be in reproducing. Sound familiar? To anthropomorphize a bit further, we can imagine having extra mouths on our feet, and lungs in our hips and legs, and many extra mouths on our fingers. Our upper torso submerged in the earth, we wiggle and grope blindly around with our long, tendril-like fingers, seeking out nutrients, eating what we find, and storing what extra we can to share with fellow members of our species. When we find fellow tribe members in need, we can imagine the hairs on our arms like the many thousands of microscopic appendages that sprout from each little root, sensing movement at the slightest touch. We can imagine our ears being distributed throughout our entire body, hearing the outside world along with the vibrations emanating through the ground. It makes one wonder if the grass has learned to sense the vibrations from oncoming lawnmowers, as we now know that they release warning pheromones to each other when they're caught or damaged. Blooming plants are basically hermaphroditic and dual-gendered. Some are asexual, self-pollinators, and some are inbred reproducers, cross-pollinators, sharing reproductive material across multiple flowers of the same tree. Though if we consider the entire plant to be a singular organism, this could be viewed as asexual. To anthropomorphize further still, some like to bring other species into the party to aid in their self-pollination. We can imagine in great detail an orgy taking place with a very specific set of people whom, for millennia, have dependably manipulated a certain species, let's say, a frisky goat, to unknowingly act as a transporter for their reproductive, reproductive material. At the great seasonal orgy, everyone is just busting off constantly, hoping that one of the goats they tricked into consistently returning to the orgy room is visually attracted to them and thinks they smell nice, so that they come over and get some reproductive material on their backs, and they then proceed to rub that material off onto another orgy member. Meanwhile, in another tree orgy, a predatory naked mole rat suddenly runs up and takes a bite out of one of the flower's petals, and it screams at the volume of a human scream, way up in the ultrasonic 100,000 hertz range, calling for aid from other species to help rid them of the attacker. Yes, this really happens. The other orgy members notice that one of their fellow members has a bite taken out of them, and they start chipping in change to get a first aid kit for the injured individual, which they acquire and apply quickly. Healing molecules are sent to the affected flowering body from surrounding bodies. This also occurs between entire trees as well, via their root systems most requiring fungal colonies to distribute nutrients. Though we should note that aspens in particular do not require mycelium medium. They directly share molecules between their roots, making them the currently largest known organism. A few feet away, another naked mole rat interrupts a different tree orgy. Unfortunately for the attacking mole rat, this orgy is taking place in a bullhorn acacia tree, which has enticed a massive army of aggressive ants to make their home in its large hollow thorns, and sends them a distress pheromone. The ants perk up, their living home's alarm system blaring in their nostrils, and they burst out of their thorn rooms and swarm on the parasitic naked mole rat. In a nearby fig tree, the orgy is of a different interspecies order. The tree's tasty figs entice many wasps into their hollow bodies and act as a nursery for them to lay their eggs in. We can imagine their figs, in great detail, as inside-out genitalia by producing flowers inside of its hollow body and relying on the wasps to distribute its material to other figs. After winning a few fights by decapitating all the other females, one wasp decides it's going to play it selfish and lays many eggs across many fig nurseries. She doesn't bother gathering pollen from the other figs, she's more concerned about reproducing for her own kingdom. Because of this decision, the tree cuts off the lifeblood of that fig nursery and drops the wasp's young onto the ground in retribution, killing all of her babies in one fell swoop. In fact, the established mutualism between these two is so strong that the tree can detect which eggs are hers and drop all of the nursery figs containing only her eggs, cutting off the entire bloodline from participating in any future interspecies relations. Them's bad blood in that bloodline! The great tree orgies come around only one season a year, and many have only a week or two where they have a chance to reproduce, so some desperate measures have evolved. Plants can't feel pain the way humans do, they more so rely on the feelings of affect and valence. 
the notions, disturbances, and distresses that quickly begin affecting their bodies. This is much like how a human's immune system can fail and can send distress signals all across our awareness, making us feel uncomfortable in a variety of distinguishable ways. They send warning pheromones when encountering stress, just like humans have three types of sweat. The one that smells most terrible emanates during times of stress, called stress sweat. The flowers scream out with their mouth feet into the dark carbon dioxide laden abyss to call upon familiars, the species that they've managed to establish relationships with. Almost like Helen Keller, desperately making sounds and movements until finally Anne Sullivan came along and aided her in 1887. Because blooming plants don't feel pain, they're okay with filling their colorful genitalia with nutritious fluids and sweet nectars so that the mammals can take bites out of them and ingest their seeds to naturally fertilize later. By pooping! They're also cool with bats eating their fruit if they get a bit of their reproductive material on their backs to carry around throughout the orgy tree. This is the way that plants have done things for a few billion years now. They've become incredibly symbiotic with organisms not only outside of their species, but outside of their entire kingdom. And they did it all blind, using only feeling, sound, smell, temperature detection, and various forms of stimuli. Such a beautiful product of evolution. Plants rule. This has been Sexualizing Plants with Patrick Compton at Polymath Park. I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. And resigns itself to a state of interspecies cuckoldry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's enough of that.